Hello, friend. Automating things on a computer can be challenging. If you've ever written any amount of code, even a single line of code, you are a real developer. And don't let anyone else tell you otherwise. In this tutorial, you're going to learn how to build serverless functions with JavaScript, deploy them to Netlify, and secure them with Okta. Let's get started. Serverless computing, sometimes referred to as functions as a service, is an on-demand approach to providing back-end application services and perhaps an API. The serverless architecture is an excellent solution for many use cases where an application needs a back-end um, occasionally or periodically or maybe a back-end that can scale to meet a demand like a big spike in uh, usage or traffic. Um, Netlify that we're going to be using in this tutorial is a hosting company that dramatically simplifies deploying websites and serverless functions, which they call Netlify functions, with continuous integration and other um, really awesome features. Okta is an identity and access management company that makes adding things like authentication and authorization to your applications very easily. Before we jump into the project, there's a few things that you're going to want to have on your machine, on your system. And the first of those is Node.js. Uh, I recommend version 12 or higher as of this recording. Version 12 is the latest uh, stable um, and long-term supported release of Node.js. Um, you can go to nodejs.org and click on the uh, download button for your operating system. However, if you are running on Mac or Linux, I highly recommend that you go find MVM, the Node Version Manager, and install that on your system first. MVM is a really great command line utility that allows you to install versions of Node, including um, you can exp you can have version 12 installed on your system and version 14 if you want to experiment with some of the new features coming out in the next release of Node, and you can switch back and forth using NVM. Another thing you're going to want to have is uh, a Netlify account. You can go to netlify.com and sign up for a free account. There's a number of things that you can do uh, with Netlify that cost you nothing. And the examples of this tutorial that we're going to be going through um, will not cost you anything. Another thing that you're going to want to have is a Okta developer account. This is also free. Um, and it's free forever. You can use this for any of the proof of concepts or small applications or anything for up to a thousand monthly active users, uh, which is, you know, fantastic. I use it all the time. You're also going to want a good code editor. And if you don't already have one, I recommend Visual Studio Code. I use this all the time. And I think it's one of the best JavaScript and Node.js uh, debugging tools and editors available. All right, so let's get into creating some code. So we need to create our serverless project. And to get started, you want to open up your command prompt or your terminal, depending on which type of operating system you're on, and change to the folder where you normally store your uh, projects. For me, I install, um, I work on projects in a folder called projects. And in this example, I've got a folder named tutorials. Um, so start by creating a directory 
Um, if you're on Windows, you will use the MD command. Uh, but I'm going to use make dir because I'm on Mac. And let's call this the secure serverless tutorial. And then change to that directory. To start any new Node.js project, which is we're using Node as a as a starting point. It's oh, we're not building a Node application. We're building a front end application that uses uh, some Node type things uh, with the serverless functions. But any type of project that uses Node and Node modules and the the ecosystem that that's around Node and npm, we need to have Node.js installed. So one thing you can do is uh, type in node-v at the command line to see if node is actually installed and working correctly on your system. If you get an error with this command, then that means that either you don't have node installed or maybe you just now installed it and you need to restart your terminal or your command prompt or, or you know, worst case scenario, you might have to restart your computer. Hopefully we're beyond those days. Uh, where we have to restart our computers every time we install something, but um, it still it still happens sometimes. All right, so with Node installed, uh, Node comes with the NPM, the Node Package Manager, and we use NPM to initialize our project. So NPM init dash y dash y uh, argument tells npm to just whatever the defaults are uh, create a a project file with those defaults so it creates a file called package.json in your folder and depending on your defaults um, is going to populate this package.json with those the package.json is a way for node to keep track of dependencies such as you want to install an external library to use in your project. When you use npm to install that, it's going to add a reference to that dependency into your package.json file. And speaking of dependencies, that's what we need to do next. So there's a number of things uh, we need to install. One of the things that I install first before I do anything else is install, MP, uh, install eslint. ESLint is a linting tool for JavaScript. It helps us to identify mistakes in our code, uh, common mistakes, um, maybe unused variables. There's, there's lots and lots of rules that can be configured with ESLint to uh, help you to write better JavaScript code. And we all know we need all the help we can get <laughs> when we write JavaScript. So uh, I'm going to install this as a developer dependency. You know, we don't need ESLint running in production. So I'm going to use the dash dash save dash dev argument. And I want uh, ESLint. And me personally, I use ESLint uh, config reverent geek. This is my own set of ESLint rules that help me not only with um, you know, some common mistakes that can happen with JavaScript, but also the way that I like my code to be styled. So you can have styling rules as well as uh, coding and syntax rules. So let's let that install. And then next, we need to install our production dependencies. And um, first thing we're going to install is Okta sign-in widget. And I'm going to specify version 4.2. And the reason I'm specifying a an exact version is I want, you know, as long as this tutorial lives on YouTube, which could be forever, I want this tutorial to continue to work. And the way we can make sure that it continues to work, even though libraries can change over time, is to, you know, start with a very specific version that, as of this recording. 
So we need the sign-in widget. We're going to use Axios, which is a um, an API fetch library. You know, use it to call APIs. In this case, we're going to use that to call our own serverless functions. Um, a lot of modern modern browsers have what's called the fetch API built in, but um, just for compatibility reasons, we may, you know, in case you want to build a serverless based application in the future and you want to deploy that and you don't know what kind of browser uh, somebody, somebody may be accessing your web application with, uh, Axios is a kind of a, a fail safe way of doing those client side API calls. And then uh, we're going to install Netlify dash Lambda, which is going to help us with our, our Lambda functions. Um, our, I should say our serverless functions, which under the hood, um, you know, I mentioned before that Netlify calls these Netlify functions. What, what it really is, is a wrapper around AWS Lambda functions. You may have heard of serverless and you may have heard of the term Lambda, um, use those are kind of interchangeable as far as like the, the, the AWS, the Amazon web server, uh, ecosystem goes. So, um, if you were to create and deploy AWS Lambda functions, which you can do, there's a lot more work involved. Uh, there's a lot of configuration, a lot of setup, and that's one of the reasons why Netlify is such a great platform is that it takes something that can be really uh, challenging and uh, hard to configure and set up and, and makes it really, really s simple and easy. So Netlify Lambda, uh, we're using 1.6, and then we're going to also use Parcel. 1.112. Parcel is a bundling tool. Uh, you may have heard of a, a tool called Webpack. Parcel is very similar to Webpack, uh, has a lot of the same features, but uh, with Webpack, there's a lot of configuration. Again, I'm picking a tool that is kind of the easiest to start with. Parcel, uh, without having to specify any configuration at all will kind of recognize the types of files and things that you have in your application and will package up your HTML and CSS and JavaScript and all the dependencies that are used by the by your application front end and bundle those into a you know a lot of times it's a single JavaScript file that you can that will automatically be updated in your your front end code. So great tool. Um, also, we're going to be using modern JavaScript in our front end, you know, so syntax like the imports statement and arrow functions and async and await, which are great. I, I love those features of JavaScript, but again, not every version, every browser supports those features. Uh, older browsers um, may not support things like async and await. So, Parcel is going to do the job of transpiling our modern JavaScript into a um, an older syntax, equivalent syntax, that can run on across most browsers that exist today. All right, so let's install those dependencies may take a, a minute or two. I'm going to take a sip of a hot beverage. NPM's amazing.
could have took a nap. Well, that's the way it is with NPM sometimes. Now, there is one other dependency that we want, uh, another developer dependency, something we don't need for, for production, and that is RimRaf. RimRaf is a cross-platform developer dependency uh, or um, utility for removing files and directories. Um, and the reason we want RimRaf is as part of our build process. So as we want to build a, a new version of our web application, our front end code and do, use parcel to bundle all that stuff up together, um, we want to clear our distribution folder. So in a nutshell, all the code that we create for our front end application, it's going to uh, get packaged and bundled and, and all those kinds of steps and put into a folder named DIST for, for distribution. And um, we're going to clear that folder out and before we start our build process. All right, so uh, we've got our dependencies. Um, we've talked about what each of those dependencies do. Um, by the way, this video is based on a blog post that um, I've written that goes through. So basically we're following along with this blog post. If you want to uh, also pull up this blog post and follow along, I'll link, I'll have a link to it in the description below and you can pull that up in your web browser and you can kind of follow along with me. And that way you'll be able to um, copy and paste some of the code uh, instead of having to type it all in, which will save both of us a whole lot of time because you don't want to watch me typing for hours and I'm sure you don't, <laughs> you know, we're, we're beyond those days of, of, of trying to, uh, you know, retype all the code that we read in a magazine or something like that. Uh, we live in a, a gr great age for computing. All right. So now I want you to open your project in your editor of choice and makes, start making some, uh, some code changes. So I'm going to use Visual Studio Code and which um, I can call code from the command line, which is really convenient. If you don't have that ability to use code from the command line, you can open up Visual Studio Code, if, if this is what you're using, go to View and go to Command Palette or Shift Command P, one or the other, and you can um, search for Shell command to install code in your path. And that way you can call, uh, type in code at the command line and be able to launch Visual Studio Code as your editor. Uh, it's really convenient. All right, so right now we just have our package JSON file, our package lock file, and some node modules. So I want you to open up package JSON and look for this scripts. And uh, I'm going to remove the test script. Um, and I, I want to clarify or just state that testing is extremely important. Uh, we're not going to cover any tests in this tutorial, but um, I've, I've got another blog post on testing tools that are available for JavaScript and Node.js. Uh, I'll put that down in the link below, description below, and uh, highly recommend uh, checking out tools like Mocha or Jest that can add some test coverage to your application. So the scripts that we want to create, we want to create a dev script, and uh, this is where we'll run our RimRaf utility on the dis distribution folder, the dist folder. And then at the same time, after that command finishes, we're going to call parcel to uh, transpile and package up our the application. And we're going to point it to 
the client folder index.html, which we'll create in a little bit. I also want to add a script here uh, just specifically for build. So in the uh, for the build script, we're also going to use rimraf dist, and this time we'll call our Netlify lambda and use the install command on Netlify Lambda. And Netlify Lambda will find all the Netlify functions that are in the project and set up any dependencies that, that they have. And then we'll call um, parcel build. And that's, that's the two we need. All right. Now, another thing that I want to add, um, earlier I installed ESLint and my own ESLint config library. Um, I want to add an ESLint con configuration file to this project so that ESLint knows how to um, use that in the project. So I'm going to switch back to the command line and I'm going to create a file called ESLint dot ESLint dot RC, or JS, I'm sorry, I'm all over the place, eslintrc.js. Now, I can never remember the syntax. Well, first of all, if you're not on uh, a Mac or Linux, the if you're on Windows, that touch command is not probably not available unless you have the, Win, the Linux subsystem installed. Um, so equivalent command for Windows might be to... Uh, like echo out a uh, eslint rc.js, and that will just create a, a blank file. Um, touch is just a, a nice way of creating a, an empty file. Um, well, okay, so I can never remember the syntax for what goes into this eslint configuration file. And uh, so one of the handy things you can do with NPM is you can launch the documentation for any NPM module using the NPM docs command. So NPM docs, and I'm going to pass it ESLint config reverent geek, and that's going to launch a web page for the documentation for this module. And I, I know I have uh, this one here that is like the, the base configuration, but I also have these alternate alternative rule sets, and one of them is specifically for Node.js, and that's the one I want to use. So I'm going to copy that and go back to my Visual Studio Code project and paste that into this um, module. And one of the things that um, it's going to complain about is uh, I need to declare use strict mode at the top of uh, every JavaScript file in a Node.js project. This is just one of my personal uh, things that I I like to do. Now, now that I'm thinking about it, this is going to be um, a front end project too. It's not just Node.js. Uh, we're doing we're doing front end work really for the most part. Um, so maybe I need to switch to this browser version and that will be, uh, that'll be better. Um, well, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens later on. Maybe I'll, I'll put, uh, I'll put this inside our client folder when we create that. All right. So the next step um, we want to, to cover is creating um, our Okta application that we need to secure uh, everything that we're going to do going forward. So adding security to any application, such as account registration, 
logins, password policies, uh, profile management, um, you know, email confirmations, those kinds of things. That's no trivial task. And getting any of those steps wrong could have disastrous effects uh, where you're exposing your, your accounts or your client data um, to hackers. And um, that's where a service like Okta is, makes your life as a developer much easier. So to complete these next steps, uh, I want you to create a free Okta uh, developer account if you don't have one already. And to do that, you're going to go to uh, developer.okta.com and click on this sign up button. Um, click the sign up button uh, or click login and uh, pause this video and come back after you've created your account. Intermission. Do, 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 do. All right. Assuming that you have your account now, I'm going to, uh, and you're probably already logged in. I'm going to log into my account. And you're going to click on Applications. Click Add Application. And then you're given a set of choices, native, single uh, page app, web, or service. In this tutorial, we're essentially building a single page application. It's just a JavaScript front end to make calls to our APIs. So that's the type of application we're going to choose. Click Next. And then here on the application settings, you can change things like the name and the base URIs, the login URI. Let's, uh, let's name this something like uh, Secure Netlify Demo or Tutorial or whatever. Um, I'm going to name mine Tutorial Demo just to make sure that I'm not creating two of the same name. I may already have one out there called Netlify Tutorial. Um, and I want you to change the login redirect URI to remove this path implicit slash callback. So it's just going to be the uh, local host port 8080. And you can come down here and click done. And it's going to bring up this general settings page. Uh, it's got information about your your Okta project. And I want you to copy the value that's in this client credentials box called the client ID. You're going to need this um, when configuring your um, application later. All right, so next step is to create a an environment file. This is where we're going to store the configuration for our application. Create an environment file in your folder. You can do this uh, inside Visual Studio. I, that's what I'll do. I'll just right click here in this uh, project folder and create new file. And .env is the, the name of this file you need to create. And in here, we're going to have an Okta uh, client ID, and that's going to be the client ID value that you just copied out of the Okta application that you created. So we need that value, and we also need an Okta uh, org URL. Where you find your Okta org URL is go back to the Okta developer dashboard, click on dashboard up here to take you to the dashboard homepage and your org URL is in near the top on the right hand side of the page. So just highlight that and copy it 
can go back to Visual Studio Code or whatever your editor you're using and paste that in. So those are the two values. Your values are going to be different from mine, of course, uh, but paste in your client ID and your org URL. Now next, um, we're going to build our client application. So in the root of your project, create a new folder named client. And inside client, create a new file named index.html. And then I'm going to copy and paste in a bunch of, well, not a whole lot of HTML, but um, a fair amount of HTML from the uh, blog post that, that we're kind of following along with this tutorial. So uh, just to walk through what's in this HTML, it's we've got a doc type, uh, an HTML, a head, a title for this page, uh, which is secure Netlify demo. And then we've got a heading header tag, and then we've got a couple of buttons defined here, a, uh, a public button and a secure button that just have labels of test public API, test secure API. We will wire these up later in our JavaScript code. Uh, same with the sign out button, which right now has a style of visibility hidden. So this sign out button will be hidden by default when the page loads. We have an empty div tag with an ID of results. This is where we'll um, add messages and things as part of a, the output of our application. And then we have an empty widget container div tag, which we'll use to render the login uh, form for the Okta login. And then we have a reference to an index.js file. So inside this client folder, I want you to create a file named uh, site.css. And we're just going to put in some very basic um, style um, in here. It's basically, I'm going to copy and paste some code. This is just setting the default font for our web page to use Arial, Helvetica. Um, set some margins and some padding. It's just really, really basic um, CSS styling, just so that it doesn't look quite as terrible. And then um, the the big one is we need an index.js file. So create an index.js, and then I'm going to copy in quite a bit of code and then we'll walk through it. All right. So <clears throat> at the top of this, I want to save this index.html file. I forgot to do that. At the top of the index.js file, we have our import statements. So we're importing in Axios, uh, the Okta sign-in widget, um, the Okta sign-in CSS file and our own site.css file. And then we've got a couple of constants, a org URL and a client ID. Now you need to change these values to match your client ID and org URL. So even though we added these to our environment file, we still need to chain also put these into the JavaScript file. So I'm going to go over here to the environment file copy the client ID, paste that here, and then also copy and paste the org URL. And now let's continue through this JavaScript um, and explain what's going on here. There are comments uh, all in the code that explain kind of each of the steps and what these functions do, but we'll walk through it together. So we have a display message function that takes in um, any arbitrary text and displays that in the uh, that result div tag that was that's in the HTML file. Um, we have a welcome message um, 
and uh, that also enables the sign out button. So we have an update, this update profile function that takes in an ID token. And I'll explain uh, tokens in a little bit, but um, we're going to enable that sign out button, set the visibility to vis visible, and then display a message that, hey, or hello, uh, your name and, and your email, which are going to be part of that, that token. And then we have a sign out uh, function that takes in uh, the sign in widget as a argument. And um, it's going to you call some methods or some functions on that sign out widget to clear out any tokens and to sign out the current session. And then it calls window.relocation.reload to just refresh the page. We have a register events function that also takes in the uh, sign-in widget. This is an async function, so we probably have some await commands in here. Um, so in this register button events, we are registering the click events for each of the buttons that are on the page. So there's a public button for adding an event listener, which is a click event. And inside that click event, we're going to fetch from our API, our serverless functions API, um, a, a function called public test, and then display the results of that response in the browser using uh, the data that's returned from that API. And if there's an error, we catch that error and also show that error message in the browser. We also have um, the secure route. It looks pretty much identical to the public one, except we're going to use our access token to um, to make that API call. This is how you make a secure API call uh, with with Axios or the or the, some of the other types of APIs, and that is to set an authorization header on that API call using the bearer syntax. So uh, we've got a a header property with uh, authorization which is equal to bearer space and then the, uh, the access token, which to us looks like a, bit, a long string of gibberish, uh, but to a computer, the access token is something that it can parse and verify and, um, you know, extract information out of. It's, it's not encrypted, but it's, it's kind of like it's opaque to to us as as humans computers can interpret it though um and then we have our sign out button that just calls our sign out function um we have a function called show sign in that's going to this render the sign in widget uh with our with things like our our octa client id and uh, properties like the redirect uri so that it knows to redirect back to our local host application and, um, you know, sets a number of properties and sets a scope. Uh, we want open ID and profile and email scopes are like, you know, these are the things I want you to include with the response back from, uh, logging in. These are all parts of the OAuth and open ID connect or open OIDC, um, standards. Um, so, you know, everything that's, that Okta does is part of a, an OAuth standard, uh, that, uh, that's portable across any type of app, web application that supports OAuth and OpenID Connect. We have a run Okta login function, which takes in that sign-in widget, and it's going to see if there is an active session like a session means that a person's logged in. Um, if that session is active, then it's going to 
check to see if there are tokens in the URL. That you know what happens is um, the login form goes out to Okta. You know, same similar to if you're if you ever log into something and it's asking you to log into uh, Google or your Gmail account or uh, Facebook. You know, those kinds of things. That's that's kind of like an OAuth. Um, login where it goes and logs you into this other service provider and then redirects you back to the application uh, with your um, with your keys or your your tokens uh, so that you can use the application and that's what's happening here is that uh, when you sign in with the Okta sign in widget it goes and logs you in to your Okta account and then redirects you back to the application with some information in the URL as like um, um, query string parameters. And um, so we can pull the, that information out of the um, URL and be able to complete that OAuth exchange um, by adding those tokens to our, our application. All right, so we parse those tokens from URL, which completes that, that OAuth, OIDC um, cycle. And we store the ID token and the access token in our local token manager. The ID token, or the access token is the one that's important for security. This is your, this is your, like your hotel key, right? That gives you access, you know, here's a card, here's a token. Now give me access to the room that I'm supposed to have access to. Or in this case, here's my access token. Give me access to the API that I, sh that I should have access to. The ID token is uh, similar, but it also provides information about who the person is that, log that is currently logged in. Um, there are things like that person's name, the email address, depending on what claims, um, uh, as we talked about before, were specified during the OpenID um, Connect call to log in. And then, um, so if we, we af after we make sure that we've processed any uh, redirect um, and we have our tokens stored, then we're going to get our ID token and update the profile information. Um, one thing to note is that even even though we may have an active session, perhaps you've logged in to your Okta account and looked at the dashboard, you may have an uh, you know an active session, but you may not have what this application is looking for, and that part of what it's looking for is an ID token. And if it doesn't have an ID token, then it can still show the uh, the sign in form so that you can log in again and get the the correct uh, data that this application needs. And then finally, we have a document loaded uh, event that we're listening to. It's kind of like your, uh, this is how we know that the web page is finished loading and rendering and we're ready to kick off our uh, JavaScript code to, to do all the things that were listed above. Um, so we're going to create the sign-in widget and use uh, like our Okta org URL. Um, and we're saying if we're going to turn on registration for this widget so that if someone doesn't already have an Okta account um, as part of your application, they can register themselves, you know, fill out profile information and get that, that email verification and all those kinds of standard steps that go along with providing a, a, a good web application experience. And then we wire up our buttons and um, run the, uh, the login experience. All right, so that's, that's a whole lot of JavaScript code that we've, that we've gone through. And I hope the, the comments and everything are, you know, help to explain uh, what each of those steps are doing. And now this project, is using 
what some people would refer to as vanilla JavaScript or uh, plain JavaScript, we could have used a, a framework like uh, React or Angular or Vue to do all these same things. So instead of registering those button click events, we could have relied on a framework like React or Vue to, to do those things for us, or even use something like jQuery. Um, whatever tool you're most comfortable with, um, feel free to, you know, refactor this code to you to work with your tool of choice. I will say that if you use a popular framework like React or Vue or um, Angular, we have um, Octa-specific components that are available for those frameworks that you can plug in and, you know, make your life even, even easier. The main thing to understand is that from this front-end code is that you're using the Octa sign-in widget to log in and receive an OAuth access token and an OpenID Connect token, the OIDC ID token. And the access token is the key that allows you as the person logged in to access a secure resource, such as an API. Um, and that's what gives you authorization to do that. The ID token includes information about your identity um, of the person that is logged in, such as the name and email address. All right. As I mentioned before, under the hood, Netlify functions are AWS Lambdas. And Netlify makes it so much easier to create and deploy and maintain these Lambda functions. One thing you need to know about serverless is they serverless functions are entirely self-contained and independent of one another and independent of the rest of the code that may be in your project. That means if your function has any dependencies, you have to install those dependencies separately uh, from the main project. Uh, you package, as part of the, the process of deploying, you have to package up those dependencies uh, during the build process and deploy them with the function, um, the function code. So the first step uh, to doing this, starting our, our serverless side of the project is to install the Netlify CLI tool. So let's go back to the command line. And there's two approaches. The Netlify documentation will tell you that you want to install the Netlify CLI tool as a global package, meaning you can call Netlify CLI anywhere on your system at any time. Um, I tend, I'm of the opinion that um, you should limit how many global um, modules you have installed on your system, if, if at all possible. And with the latest versions of Node, it makes it possible to use a global type um, utility without installing it globally. Now, if you're in, if you're comfortable with with installing something globally, then you do that by typing npm install dash g, which is the global argument, Netlify CLI, and that would that would do the trick. Now you can call that function anywhere. Uh, but instead, I am going to install this as a developer dependency to this, this particular project. And uh, this one, this one's going to take a while. Um, there's a lot in this utility, this command line utility. So um, I may speed uh, speed up this process, but I will definitely uh, take another sip of a hot caffeinated beverage. Beverage? Beverage? Wow. 
wow, it is done. And so I can call this function, or you can call this function, without having to install it globally, using a cool new utility in, that's included with Node called MPX. And MPX is like a Node package executor, I guess is my, <laughs> what, what the X stands for, um, that allows you to execute any um, module anywhere from at any time. But if that module is installed as a dependency locally to the to the project folder that you're in, it's going to use the one that's already installed, which is you know going to save a whole lot of time. So um, uh, we're not going to run this command yet. I'm just telling you what uh, what what's ahead. All right. So the next thing we need to do is add some configuration to our project that's that the Netlify CLI tool is going to use. To It's going to use this to create the functions and when building and deploying the application uh, locally and building and deploying that application um, it to production in Netlify, um, Netlify hosting. So in the root of your project, create a new file named netlify.toml or toml. I, I guess you pronounce these as toml files. Um, I'm not even sure what toml stands for. Some kind of markup. Um, but anyway. Um, and then switch over to uh, Visual Studio Code. Open up that Netlify toml file. And I'm going to paste in uh, some configuration here. So we have three major sections of configuration. There's a build, a dev, and a redirects. So the build section specifies the commands and configuration for building and deploying the Netlify application. So the command to build, which is npm run build, we defined that in the package JSON file. Uh, we're telling it that any Netlify functions are going to be found in a source folder under functions. Uh, we're specifying that our node environment is version 12 and that our publish folder is what we want to publish when we deploy the application is going to be a folder named dist, our distribution folder. For development environment things, we're specifying that the port we're going to use is 8080. Again, the publish folder is the dist folder, and the command to run our de development environment is npm run dev, which you know we also uh, defined in the package JSON file. And then finally, we have a redirects block that is telling Netlify when Netlify um, builds and deploy Netlify functions, by default, they are at this path, slash dot Netlify slash functions. And, you know, that works, but it's kind of, kind of ugly. <laughs> but let, you know, thankfully, we've got a way using these redirects to use whatever path we want. So, if we want a path, be able to call uh, localhost colon 8080 slash API slash whatever name of our serverless function is, we can do that. And it's going to uh, map that call from uh, API to the actual underlying uh, path, which is dot Netlify slash functions. And that's what we need. So the next thing we're going to do is use the Netlify command, the Netlify CLI tool, to create the functions that we want. So I'm going to use MPX Netlify functions create. Um, specify a name of public dash test. All right, and I get a warning or an error message that the functions folder specified in the Netlify toml 
file is not found. Um, so we, we're looking, it's looking for this source slash functions, which we haven't created. So I can either use the command line to make that those directories here, or I can switch over to Visual Studio Code and, um, and make those uh, folders here. So I'll say source and create a folder underneath source called functions. All right. Now let's go back and try running that command again. This time we get further. Um, it's asking us to pick a template. What kind of serverless function do we want to create? And there's, you know, lots of examples that, that we can choose from as kind of like a, a starting point. Um, in this case, let's just choose Hello World, um, a, a basic uh, Hello World function, serverless function. It's now been created. If we go back to our project, we'll see that we have a uh, a public test folder and under public test we have a public test dot js file and this has um all of our the the basic javascript code now eslint is complaining about a number of things because it's not formatted the way that i would normally want to see things formatted um if i just resave that file and it, it's going to clean some of that up. All right. So that's the that's the public one. We also want to create a secure serverless function. So let's uh, use the same command and we'll name this one um, secure dash test. Again, choose hello world. And uh, before we go any further, as I mentioned before, if, if a serverless function has needs a dependency of any kind, that has to be um, set up, installed separately, or copied into that project folder separately um, because uh, serverless functions are independent from everything else, including other serverless functions. Uh, in our secure test, uh, function, we need to be able to verify the access token that's being passed to know if the person who is requesting that API is, if that token is valid and if that person is authorized. And we're going to use a tool to help us called the JWT verifier. So you, from the command line, change to the source functions secure test folder and use npm to first uh, initialize that folder so we get our package JSON file and then use npm install to install Okta JWT verifier version 1. All right, now we need to update our project with some code. So in the functions, um, secure test, open up that secure test folder and open up the secure-test.javascript file. Right now it's just the hello world JavaScript code. I'm going to delete all of that and paste in a um, code from uh, the, uh, the blog post that we're following along with. So this code, and it's, re it's uh, complaining about some things. I'm going to go back, excuse me, and uh, in the ESLint RC JS file that we created to begin with, I'm going to change this uh, back to node instead of browser. That'll just make me feel better. <laughs> so in our secure, .j, secure test 
JavaScript file. I'll walk through this. We're requiring in our, our Okta JWT verifier uh, module that we uh, installed as a dependency. We have a function called verify token. Verify token. It's an uh, async function that takes in the uh, auth header uh, from the request that's, that's coming in um, to the API. And it uh, splits that auth header uh, on a space. So if you remember the, the standard syntax for um, passing a token to any res uh, HTTP resource like an API is to use that bearer syntax. So it's like your auth headers are equal to bearer space and then the, the token. So what we expect is that when we split that header on that space, that we're going to get two parts. And the first part is going to be equal to bearer. And the second part is going to be the token. So we expect to have an access token. If there are, if there aren't two parts and that first part is not equal to bearer, then we're going to return null, which, you know, to our code is going to indicate that someone is trying to access this API and they're not passing any access token at all, um, which is a no-no, right? Because we want this to be secure. Um, so we're going to take the access token from that second uh, part of the uh, authorization header, and then we're going to use the JWT verifier um, with our org URL and the client ID. These are re being read from the envir environment, and we're going to call a verify access token, passing in the access token that was sent as part of the request on the authorization header, and uh, this default scope of uh, API default. And if everything went went okay, then it returns the parsed JSON web token, or JWT. Um, as, as I mentioned before, access tokens, ID tokens, um, OAuth, OpenIDC, uh, Open OIDC, uh, these tokens are the, the format of these tokens are JSON web tokens. And uh, JSON web tokens is just a, a standard way of packaging up um, uh, information and they can they have a what's called a cryptography a cryptographic signature. And that signature helps uh, the, the verifier to know whether or not that token has been tampered with. Uh, since it was originally uh, issued by the authorization server. So an authorization server, when you log in, it, it, it uh, provides that access token, generates that access token, and provides it back to your, your client-side code. And if you try to do anything with that token, if you try to <laughs> insert more data into that token or, or try to falsify that that token, the verifier is going to know uh, that that you've tampered with it. Also inside a JWT uh, is things like an expiration date. So JSON web tokens don't live forever. Uh, they're they're relatively short, have relatively short lives, and that's another you know security standard. Um, so if a token is expired, then the verifier is going to reject that token and whoever's using that token won't have access to that resource until they get a new uh, access token. All right, so enough of that. So that was our verify token function. And then the magic for a serverless function is the handler. So uh, the standard syntax for the handler is it, it is an async function. It takes in an event and a request context, which we're not using the context in this example. 
Um, but the context can include things about the request, maybe some data that was passed along or, um, or whatever. So the JWT, uh, we're going to call a verified token passing in the event dot headers dot authorization. So this is like the, the request that's come in. And if we got nothing back, if the JWT is null, then we know, well, maybe there's, there's either a problem with the token or maybe there was no token at all. So we're going to return uh, 401, which is the status code for not authorized. And with the text, you are not authorized to access this resource. But if everything was good, then we're going to return a status code of 200, which is the, the OK status. And with the headers that are the content type that we are returning is application JSON. And the body of our response is going to be a message, a, a JSON um, or a JavaScript object with the property of a message that has hello. And then we're passing back uh, a claim that's embedded in that JWT. So the JWT that was parsed, that's that's the access token, it has some, you know, some basic information in it. And uh, we can pass that back from the API. Now, normally, uh, I'm not doing this in this tutorial, but you would take that access token and perhaps make additional calls to other APIs or, or to use that, use that access token to make um, calls to an internal service or uh, maybe a database or, or whatever. Um, that access token can, you know, be passed along to make other, other calls to other things uh, within your, the architecture of your application so that, um, that those things know who, who that person is that's requesting the information. All right. So I knit. I think we are now ready to test everything that we've done so far. So let's uh, let's close all these files and let's open up, go back to our our terminal and change back to the root of our project. And let's call NPX Netlify dev. And this is going to, um, I think I have something else running. Let's try that again. It's going to spin up a local development web server and it's going to host the Netlify functions locally so that we can test those functions locally. It's going to call those build commands uh, such as you know, clearing the distribution folder, calling parcel to package up our HTML and CSS and JavaScript and all that kind of stuff and deploy it. And it now says that the server is ready on localhost 8080 and parcel has built our application. Now, before we open up the browser, just wanted to show you, if you go back to Visual Studio Code or if you want to you know, look at it some other way, you'll see that you now have a folder in the project called dist and, you know, it, man, it stuck a whole bunch of stuff out here in this folder. That's because it was able to package up all those dependencies, all the files that are associated with those dependencies, uh, like the CSS for, and resources for the Okta sign-in widget and yeah, just tons and tons of stuff that's now part of the, uh, our web application that, that our application depends on. Um, so that's going to get cleared out every time we, we rebuild our, our project and, you know, parcel is going to create all that stuff for us again. So open up 
your browser and go to localhost 8080. Now I recommend um, to get like a true end-to-end -end test that you uh, launch a private window, uh, private browser instance. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to open up um, an incognito browser window and go to localhost 8080. One thing uh, to note is Chrome has added, if you're using Chrome, Chrome has added this function or this option down here, and it may be turned on by default, but it says block third-party cookies. Uh, if you turn this on, right as, as of this recording, it's going to break um, the Okta sign-in. So you need to allow third-party cookies uh, in order for the session um, system, the cookies that, that Okta sets when, when you log in, uh, to work correctly. So make sure that if you're going to use an incognito window, that you have uh, these third-party cookies enabled, or it's not going to work. All right. So you should see what I'm seeing uh, Netlify function tester. We've got a couple of buttons up here and then we have our sign in, uh, username, password. And then there's also a link down at the bottom that says, if you don't have an account, then you can click sign up. So enter your Okta developer account credentials, the, the same ones that you use to create your, your Okta developer account. Um, you can also create other logins. You can also use the, the register function to create a whole new login if you've got a different email address. And if all goes well, it's going to sign in and you've got, um, you know, it went very, very fast, but you may notice in the URL that, you know, the URL was full of stuff at one time and now it's not anymore. Those, those were like the intermediary uh, code and uh, temporary tokens and things that the login needed to complete the OAuth and uh, OIDC um, authorization process. So now we're, we're logged in. We see a new message. Hello. You know, for me, it's hello, David Neal, and my email address. And um, that's pulled out of the ID token that was part of OIDC. And then we can click Test Public API, and we get a, a message back, Hello World, as we would expect. Um, uh, and that's calling our local functions. And then Test Secure API, it worked if everything goes well and you know, you're signed in, you've got your access token, it can call that secure API endpoint and uh, verify the token and respond back with hello. And one of the claims inside that access token is, it's called SUB, that, that stands for subject. And the subject of that claim or the subject of that access token is you. It's your ID, your, in this case, email address. And then finally, we have a, um, a, a sign out button. And, you know, we get our form again to log back in. It clears the, uh, the login session and uh, we're back to the beginning. Sweet. Everything is working and going to plan. Here's where I would insert a animated GIF. It's working. Yes, success. I hope you're having success <laughs> as you're following along in this tutorial. Um, so now we've got our application working locally. What do we? What's next? Well, the next step is to set up continuous deployment with Netlify. We want to we want to deploy this thing into production, and to do that, uh, let's create our Netlify account, if you don't have it already, 
Um, go to Netlify.com, sign up for your account. But the first step to get this to work like we want it, uh, so that every time we make changes to our code, that code gets redeployed through Netlify automatically, uh, we need to put all this code that we've created so far into a uh, Git repository that Netlify can access. So Netlify supports uh, GitHub and GitLab and Bitbucket and you know maybe some others, uh, which all have free editions of public Git repository hosting. Um, I recommend that you pause this video and follow along the instructions that, that are provided by your Git host of choice to create a new repository for your project um, and maybe you know make that that first step whatever you're comfortable with and come back um, I am going to go to my github account and I'm going to create a new repository And I'm going to call it uh, Secure Netlify Demo, which is available. I'm going to make sure that it's public. Now, Netlify will work with private repos too, um, through uh, you know your authorization. Uh, you can grant it access to to view your um, you know your repository. I'm going to create this. repository and um, you know when you create a repository in github it gives you another a number of steps that you can use to initialize your project um, so I'm going to follow kind of these steps right here from the command line so I'm going to come over to here press control C to stop my local development server I'm going to use git init to initialize an empty git repository and one thing that I want to make sure is that not everything that we have in this project is something that we want to commit to our repository uh, specifically like the like the env file uh, that is that is environmental specific configuration specific to like my local development um, you know, and it may, you, you may have some secrets in that file um, at some point that you don't want to, to commit to a, a repository. So I'm going to create a git, a dot git ignore file. And in Visual Studio Code, I'm going to open up that git ignore and um, copy and paste in some stuff here. So we don't want to <laughs> commit our entire no node modules folder to our to source control. Um, that's that's bad. Uh, we want to ignore our env file, and then you know just anything else that might might show up. We don't want to commit our distribution folder either because that's going to get created and at every time we deploy or Netlify is going to run our deployments on their system to set up um, the dependencies and everything to deploy your project. Um, let's see. So back to command line. We, we ran git init. Let's add uh, a git remote add origin and then the address for your repository i'm going to add my repository paste that in there and then i'm going to get add everything if i look at get status which i always do it's kind of like a sanity check uh, make sure that nothing that i don't want to deploy is getting 
getting deployed. That all looks good. I'm going to commit that um, as a an initial commit as the message. And then I'm going to git push with a dash u. So the first time you push to a new um, remote, like we set up a remote to your repository, um, and I, I'm using my repository, dash u is going to tell git to use that repository or that, that branch from now on uh, to push things to. So anytime we type git push without any parameters or additional arguments, it's going to push the current um, branch to production or to um, the uh, main branch. All right, now that, that we've got that code deployed or that code committed to the repository, we can go back to the repository, refresh here, everything's good. We, everything was committed a, a minute ago. Now, go over to Netlify and log in to your Netlify account if you're not already logged in. I'm going to log in with my GitHub account. And I've already got, you know, some other stuff sitting out here. But you want to click New Site from Git. And uh, as I mentioned before, it supports GitHub, GitLab, and Bitbucket. I'm going to click on the GitHub button because that's what I'm using. And it's going to... It, it popped up a separate window to authorize my GitHub account, which I've already done before. So that that only took a second and went away. Uh, it might take an additional step for you to log in and grant access to um, Netlify to access your uh, repositories. That in itself is an OAuth flow where you're logging, you're using your credentials with GitHub and you're granting um, Netlify a specific set of privileges. Um, and it's, you know, under the covers, it's using OAuth to create that, that access token that it's going to use to make API calls um, to your, your Git um, repository. Pretty cool stuff. Um, anyway, I've got a whole bunch of repositories sitting out here. I don't want to browse through them, so I'm going to say uh, search for secure. And there's my secure Netlify demo that we just created. I'm going to click on that one. And then, um, let's see what else. One thing we need to do is we need to do a couple of advanced steps. So everything else is fine. It picked up from, it It actually read the Netlify TOML file from the repository, so it knows that the build command is npm run build, and the published directory is going to be the dist folder. But under advanced is where you define environment variables. So, so since we are not deploying the .env file, uh, we need to set environment variables for this particular application. So click on new variable, and I'm going to just pop over to Visual Studio Code and open up that environment file. And um, so we want one called Okta Client ID. So the this could change, you know, like if, if you wanted to have a separate Okta application instance for local development and another one for production, um, this is where, you know, you would, this would be different for your environment. I'm going to create another new variable 
and that's going to be the Okta org URL. And now we're ready to deploy. All right, so the name of my application is Fervent Turing D1D 536. I'll commit that to memory. Yours is going to be different. Um, but the cool thing about Netlify is it creates these kind of placeholder URLs that you can use to view your application. So while it's building, let's see what else we may want to do. Um, when this is done, it's going to generate a URL for this website. And before we can actually test um, this application, we're going to lead, need to let Okta know this new URL that we're using. So um, let's see how far along we are. So I think if you uh, click on the site deploy in progress, you can actually see um, you know, a little more details. You can drill down into um, and actually see the build process and everything that's been going on. So I think it's done. Mine is. Let's make, let's see. Uh, it still says it's in progress. Time for another sip of a hot brevid. What did I say? And there we are. Netlify has deployed our application. I just needed to have a sip of coffee. Um, so here's our URL. We need to let Okta know that we're using this new, our, new URL and to permit this new URL is as part of the login process. So right click on this link and copy that, that link address. And now go over to your Okta account and click on applications. Go to the, um, the application that you created for the, um, this tutorial. Click on the general tab and you know we've got all our settings. We've got things like this login and stuff. Click on this edit button and we need to add some URIs so that Okta knows these are valid. So on the login URI, paste in that new URL and for the logout, do the same. And then um, we also need to change the initiate log. You don't have to, but I'm going to go ahead and change this initiate login URI. Uh, this this should be whatever your production site is, not local host. Um, so this is fine. And... Let's click save. All right. Now, there's one other thing we have to do with Okta, and that is to add this site as a trusted um, origin, is, is the terminology that's used. So um, Okta knows that if a redirect comes from this site, it's it's okay, it's it's expected. So, click on go to AP, the API menu. Click on Trusted Origins, and here, click on Add Origin, and we'll give it a a name like uh, Netlify Secure Serverless Tutorial. 
um, the URL for the app. And we want to allow cores and redirect and click save. Cool. So now if we were ready to test, so open up another browser or open up a, uh, let's open up a, an incognito. Go to that URL. Sweet. We got uh, our buttons and now we got our, our login showing up here. Let's try logging in. Boom. It's, it's working. It's working. Test the public API. <sighs> Hello world. Now this is, this is um, calling Netlify functions. This is going off and, and uh, executing a function that lives somewhere else in the cloud. This is an AWS, a true AWS serverless function. So the public one works. The secure one works. And then we can sign out. If we try to call secure API function when we're not logged in, it tells us we're not logged in. We can't use that. We can still hit the, the public one, though. Sweet, sweet, sweet. All right. That is it. Oh, except maybe we want to make a change. And, um, yeah, we want to see that we can deploy a new version of our application um, within a minute or two which is, you know, one of the beauties of working with um, serverless functions, uh, so working with Netlify. So let's go make a change to the application. Whoops. Don't know what's going on there, but don't save that. Um, let's go to our functions, maybe the maybe the secure test and change the message from hello, whatever this is to hello period. It's working. Maybe change something on the home homepage too. Uh, let's see. So go to the client index.html file add another uh, something here let's just call it hey y'all so go back to the command line we do a get status we should see two files have been changed Let's uh, add those two files, commit them to um, the branch, just call it changes for the demo, and then let's push. Pushed to the Git repository, and now if we go over to our... Um, Netlify account. Let's see. Maybe re go to the deploys tab. Looky there. It is now building a new version of the application and it has the commit message that we that I put in there, changes for the demo. And if I want to, I can click on that and I can actually watch the deploy happen. Um which should be about done. 
still says it's building. It's probably packaging up those uh, those functions. Let's go back and look at that again. So it's running npm build. What it needs is a, another sip of coffee. There we go. Now it's created all these distribution files all the way down, and now it says the site is live. So let's go back to the uh, incognito window that we had open earlier. I'm going to refresh this page. Looky there. Hey, y'all. Log in again. Whoops. Helps to type in the correct password. Test our secure API. It's working. Yes. Well, that is it. We've done all the steps, all the things that we've set out to do. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed uh, creating this, learning how to create secure serverless functions uh, using Netlify. As I've said before, Netlify makes deploying applications so easy. Okta makes adding authentication and authorization to your applications so easy than having to do these kinds of things on your own. Um, so again, I'm going to post some links to some resources into the description below. And, um, as always, you don't need permission to be awesome. You get out there, you take this stuff that you're learning and you do some awesome things with it. I would love to hear your feedback. If you have any comments or questions, leave those down below. And until next time. Hope you have a blessed day. See ya.